maybe we can figure out, have you taken a look at your, your horrible place to see? I mean, I'm thinking that, I mean, we're all going to have some different books, but certainly we'll have people with a lot of Yeah, so I, the other thing I was going to say is I think Sahar wanted to do a group like that, but it didn't go anywhere. Just, just to sort of let you know, I don't think you're going to be stepping on her toes or anything. Well, I'll invite her. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, like, she was going to, she, she wanted to do a similar idea, but I don't think it was anywhere. Do we have a link? Like, it went as far as like, people signing up. I'm right. much more forceful. I did? I did, yes. <laughs> Got that. Okay. She <laughs> said she wants to have a reading group, damn it. There's got to be a reading group. Well, I did too, and I put a spreadsheet together and started collecting stuff. Yeah, that's funny. Well, I didn't, I didn't, that I didn't hear anything about a spreadsheet. Because you weren't in that class. This was part of a. Uh, this was part of intro. That's how old this is. Oh. Because I was like way back the first semester trying to get this stuff going. So I was like, I'm. Why didn't you like on your Twitter? Well, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. I didn't know you. You could have said something last semester. I certainly would have been out. So I would have been all over that. I know, right? It is usually my fault. Lots of things are my fault. Oh no, that's favorite part. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm for sure 100% all on board on that because I, the one I'm not worried about dissertation at all. I am absolutely 100% worried about that core, um, the core test. I'm not, I'm not even worried about my, my two other lists because I already have a point of view. I already know what the hell I'm doing there. In fact, I've already started reading, writing my, my lit review for my dissertation. Okay. So I already know what I'm going to do with that. But for that core list and how to pull in. Um, those ideas from those particular texts and how they relate. I mean, like this, this, this question that they want to ask us: What is text and technology, and, and what is interdisciplinarity? Yeah. I mean, that is like so insanely broad. How are you even supposed to approach that? It is also the question everyone is always going to be asked: Like, what is the program? What is text and technology? What is text and technology? I literally got that last like last week. My parents like, what is your program? I didn't take that class. 
Yeah. That's why it's on the list. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sharing this panel impromptu like is because I'm going to be live streaming this panel. Uh, the camera, as you'll see, is not on the audience, but only on the panel, just so you know. Uh, we will be taking questions. We'll see how this goes. A little bit of an experiment, so bear with me. Um, but there will be, uh, hopefully, questions across the live stream. Um, and as, you'll, as I'll discuss, um, I'm going to be talking about how uh, the affordances of live streaming technology. So, all right. Without further ado, um, my name, again, is Chris Rizicki. I just graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And uh, I'm going to be starting at, at the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design part-time in the fall, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, live streaming technologies, uh, focus more on Twitch, which is, as you may or may not know, is a game streaming, primarily a game streaming platform. However, uh, I, although I'm a media scholar that does talk a lot about games in my work, I'm not specifically looking at games. Um, in fact, part of the glorious things about finishing my PhD is now I can talk about anything but games. So, um, and as I'll kind of go through, uh, there, are, there are a few moments where these uh, boundaries blur, but um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, my experience with streaming and some of the questions that came up, and especially those interactions that I would have with writers. Um, and I think there are a lot of potentials, but I also try to be mindful of the ethical considerations that have arisen uh, in these experiences. And then I'm going to conclude with a few questions that, have, uh, that I want to pose, uh, because this is an amorphous project. This is my first, I would say, major project after my PhD. Um, so that I'm at the stage where I have a lot more questions. And what I'm finding is, especially when we're talking about ethics, uh, I find myself thinking less about live streaming and more about what live streaming says about higher education. So uh, that's all good. Right. So a little bit of my background. Um, I have a few years experience as a radio broadcaster. Uh, I have a live show I uh, co-produce with a colleague, Alan Daigle. Um, we talk about um, media, basically, all things screen-based media. And I love the broadcasting um, experience. Uh, it gives us a chance to, to talk off the cuff and really play around with theory and what we're working on. And in a very, uh, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna say informal because there is a, a regiment that's attached to it, but we still, uh, it, the broadcasting experience had me wanting a little bit more. We don't play music, we don't interact, we don't take live calls or anything like that for FCC, um, just to alleviate a lot of that headache. So it left me wanting a little bit more interaction. Uh, and uh, the radio station that we're based out of is kind of not a little bit like a step up from Pirate. It is official, but it's born from the Occupy movement, the occupying the, the, the radio wave. So it does kind of have that ethos, right? Uh, so there's, there's part of this grassroots journalism also influence. Like how do we we're casting a wide net, we're broadcasting to uh, an unknown but uh, substantial audience, about five mile radius. Um, so when streaming technology kind of crossed our paths at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I saw some opportunities there. There's definitely a step in that direction. And so how we explored this at UWM was a research group that started out as serious play and informal uh, group, we talked about games and game-related issues, critiques, and it met in the university, was you know, UWM's Digital Humanities Lab. Uh, we did that for about two years. We got a nice grant for the, from the Center for 21st Century Studies because one of the, and I'll talk about this more later, the issues, space, technology, access, uh, we were running into problems when we started initiating our live streams. Because one of the things we really wanted to do in our conversations, we, you know, the issue, uh, for example, of archiving. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about software archiving and how a lot of these old works, um, inter interactive fictions, uh, games, were disappearing at a, an alarming rate. So how do we not only capture the software, but capture that experience? We turned to live streaming 
as a way of preserving activity on these uh, works of software. So we, Series Play uh, now has a, has, uh, renamed the Digital Cultures Collaboratory up in C21. Uh, we just uh, received our second uh, year grant, which is awesome, better computer, better equipment, all that good stuff, and uh, our own space. We have about six shows every week of a variety of, most of them focusing on games. Uh, so I'm, my dissertation, I uh, kind of fall to the wayside a little bit. And again, I, I have this desire for something a little bit different. Uh, and I, as I'm writing my dissertation, I'm having, I'm starting to have these, ex trying to experiment with live streaming, trying to see how this is gonna impact higher education and the way we teach classes. Okay. So I start writing my dissertation live online. And so you have, this is getting cut off a little bit, but this is the uh, screen capture of the, the, the dashboard. You've got me off on the side there. I'll just go ahead and start it. Hopefully you won't want to hear my voice. So this is what I did for about a month, month and a half, writing my first chapter of the dissertation. I would write, I had the camera on me, uh, I like to listen to really awful metal while I'm writing, and I have a, a little indie game called Mountain. It's kind of a Zen garden type thing in the corner. And you can see, uh, if you might be able to see movement up here in the chat window, and I'm trying to start initiating conversation while also taking notes for myself in this chat window. But as time goes on, I start having people popping into the chat window. Uh, other writers start joining me and they're just kind of hanging out and we form this a loose writing circle and uh, over time, to be honest, it gets to be a bit distracting. <laughs> I have to log off. Um, but what's fascinating is in some of the interactions I would have writers screenshot some of their passages and ask me to review them. Uh, I think, I can't remember his exact name, but it had something to do with Star-Lord. <laughs> and so um, creative writing is not in my, uh, my expertise, but it was so cool to have people send me stuff. And this, he, it was a link to Tiny Pick, uh, but really fascinating. Other people would chime in. I had actually other scholars and PhD students say, suggest re references and resources that I might find handy. It was a really incredible experience until it got, started getting distracting. So that was, that was that. And so I took a break from live streaming for a while until I decided for whatever reason to stream my defense. <laughs> Two of the uh, researchers in the Digital Cultures Collaboratory uh, were on my committee, so it was kind of an easy sell. However, we did have a couple people on the committee who were unsure. You might see uh, Dr. Arijit Sen pop in on the left. Uh, the camera is turned awkwardly to avoid him as much as possible because he was like live streaming computers. <laughs> I thought I was like, I don't want anything to do with it. He was open, but um, he was just unfamiliar. So that was. They were all open to this experiment. It, it turned out really, really well. Uh, there were questions of performativity that this kind of evoked. Uh, I want it was, that was actually one area in my dissertation that I admittedly had overlooked, and so I used this as a way of discussing it in, in a way that I couldn't in the dissertation uh, because I wanted to graduate. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this experience was other graduate students, um, you know, one in particular thanked me because this whole dissertation defense uh, ritual was foreign and unknown and somewhat hostile. You know, we don't, they, these, are, they, these are things that happen behind closed doors. So it was a, a nice uh, way to kind of reveal what goes on behind the higher education curtain.
All right, so before talking about some of the reflections that came up during these experiences, I want to talk briefly about Twitch. For anyone who, uh, T.L. Taylor uh, last year released, I believe it was last year, released Watch Me Play. Uh, I believe it's still one of the only books, scholarly works out there on live streaming. Taylor focuses on uh, eSports and Twitch in particular. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, lots of articles out there, however. Um, those will be coming up on the word cited. But broadly speaking, Taylor uh, defines live streaming as a medium that's rooted in globally distributed user content creators utilizing third-party platforms involving social interaction as a core component of the broadcast and embedded as well as amplified across a variety of sites. Now this is interesting. From the standpoint of a curmudgeonly white man, I look at streaming and go, why in God's name would anyone want to watch people playing video games? Um, but it's, but what I was missing was that the social interaction is the core of all of this. And that's what my experience confirmed this. Um, and this was also confirmed by some of the people who were joining me. Uh, as, and I could kind of ask questions to people, other writers and uh, students and scholars who were in the chat window, why exactly are you here? And like, is it really that interesting watching me write? And I believe it was uh, the same user Starlord had said, we're not here to watch you for your writing, we're here for your company. So it's a fascinating experience. I, again, I'm not a creative writer. I, don't, I, I haven't had that experience of having that work, writing workshops. I have done writing circles, but this was interesting because, again, you're opening it up out there. You're not walking into a room sitting down with a number of people. You're actually creating a space. So here's where the ethics start coming in. Now, if I'm, if I'm creating uh, this group, this impromptu group, and anyone is welcome to join, what sort of responsibilities do I have to that, to that group? And of course, uh, the next gray area that you have to tackle is ethics. So again, back to Twitch, uh, some, some stats. 70,000 live channels of user-generated content at, at any given time, okay? Uh, in May of this year, there were 1 billion hours of content viewed by over 1.2 million viewers. Uh, and what I'll, of course, the elephant in the room is how much money does it make for Amazon, who purchased it in 2014? Estimated $1.5 billion in annual revenue, but here's uh, the rub. One million of that is from advertising, and the other rest are from subscriptions and bits. And I want to make a note here, because this will come up later, uh, bits are like emoticon, animated emoticons. And basically what that does, um, you'll see that I don't have any. Um, <laughs> they cost money uh, to the spectator, and they add a bit, it's like a tip. You're basically adding a tipping economy to this, and uh, if you were more popular than I, you would receive bits from spectators as a way of showing appreciation. And as I'll talk you, later, you'll see how this can escalate. All right. But you're starting to get a sense of the ethical concerns that you might have as an, someone who's trained as, an, as a college instructor and interacting with uh, students not in a classroom. All right. So, um, opportunities for higher education and writing that started to emerge. Uh, we talked, the keynote yesterday, we talked a lot about collaboration. Uh, as I've already described, there were a number of uh, experiences that where collaboration was happening and it was fruitful. You know, my dissertation was a product in no small part of the collaboration of people coming into the chat room offering references, resources that were helpful. Accessibility. One of the reasons that I'm live streaming today is testing, you know, live streaming, this is not the first time a panel has been live streamed, but we are at a point where uh, faster networks, uh, increased access to these technologies, uh, we're going to, like, why, we might see more widespread adoption of live streaming in a conference setting, but this enables people from a distance to watch, access, 
and who knows, maybe even ask a few questions later. Also peer review, as I've also already described, I'm being sent material, raw material from, from writers uh, of a variety of uh, skill levels, and we're working on it together. We're working through it. Now, as I showed you, there was a screen capture of a PDF, couple, rather than instead of that, couple this with a cloud-based platform like Google Docs, and you have live streaming and uh, collaborative, synchronous writing. Those are some of the opportunities, uh, but as someone who spent way too much time in crit theory classes, I have to start getting uh, gripey. I mentioned the first, one of the other experiences we had with the series play group was uh, one instructor reviewed her, her students' works of interactive fiction over a Twitch stream. And it was completely anonymous. Uh, no students were um, named or, or you know, their pictures weren't featured. However, trolls you know, would come into the chat room and disrupt things. And you know, it was, it, you could see where even if someone's personal information was on screen, that could be picked apart because we uh, assumed that someone, another student from the same class was in that chat room uh, masquerading as someone else. So privacy issues were a concern. And according to FERPA, anything that contains student work is, is considered an education record. So what kind of problems does this pose? Is, does a Twitch stream become you know, evidence? Uh, accessibility, as much as it opens up the doors to conferences and other things, there's still technology. There's still space. There's still network speeds that um, is required to use this service. So it's not it's a double-sided coin. And finally, the big one, platform ethics. How eager am I really to uh, usher my students into yet another relationship with a global uh, corporation? You know? uh, and that's very multifaceted, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So again, Taylor mentions that uh, when she talks about um, these online spaces, to curate these spaces requires a certain sense of responsibility and accountability to the community being formed. And as uh, a instructor first, and a streamer, a distant, um, not even on the horizon type thing, my first primary concern is for the student. And so I started thinking about the demands. We have numerous demands that we have to mitigate if we're going to start looking at streaming. And I should preface this by saying that I don't advocate for streaming as, a, as, as an option necessarily. What I do as a more pragmatic approach, I do suspect that it's going to be coming whether we like it or not. So the demands of infrastructure. Uh, we have, um, my time at our tech school at Milwaukee has taught me that we still cannot assume that everyone has access to a computer, nor technology. Um, we should be wary then when Amazon is offering streamers a small loan of $2,000 for a new computer, okay? Institution, um, as you know, I'm no longer at UWM, but at the time, I was still concerned about how to work. This is their technology. This is their network. If the information that we're providing through Twitch is now owned by Amazon. Okay, so this is another concern that I have. So these are the demands between those two. Audience. What do I owe to my audience as an instructor whose primary concern is for their privacy and well-being? But also, what am I willing to do to reach out. Now, if I want to provide this service as a streamer, my personal ethics come into play. How am I, how am I take, what am I gonna, going to do to attract new viewers? How do I help the most people? So I wanna conclude by giving an example. Um, I wanna just talk 
through um, Rexadoodle's stream. Uh, Rexadoodle is a uh, economics PhD student. She's currently working through her prelim exams and she's doing this Pomodoro technique live on stream. She does for 20 minutes, she writes, uh, 10 minutes, she uh, talks, interacts with the audience. Meanwhile, people are jumping in and chatting with one another. She begins speaking, and within, I would say, two minutes, a battle, if you remember the bits, people were tipping her, and over the course of a minute, she received over 10,000 bits, the equivalent of $100. So again, we have to start asking ourselves, especially as you know, a poor graduate student, now poor part-time instructor, this becomes an intriguing offering, okay? So some of the questions that come up now are, if live streaming becomes widely adopted, what type of thing, what type of concerns? I listed off a few of them. But also, what does it tell us about our university? Okay, how, I mentioned this relationship with Amazon that I'm uh, hesitant to welcome my students into. But then I start to, I'm not also already welcoming my students into a relationship with my university, which is also a profit-seeking institution, especially after several years of budget cuts. But I'll, what does it say about our writing center? If I made, how will this impact our writing centers if I'm able to provide a service free or for, for tips? Uh, how will writing centers re respond to this? Will we have universities adopting a live stream service on the side as part of their writing centers? Uh, my, my fear, unfortunately, is that we're going to be slow to adopt this in higher education. Um, again, and this might not be because of reluctance. Right now, the legal issues that are out there are still murky and uncertain. After uh, speaking with our legal folks at UWM, the, the court essentially is still out there. But hopefully we can get this straightened out because um, I'm, unfortunately I'm afraid that we may be looking at sending our students to amazon.edu in the near future. Hi there, uh, I'm Daniel Hocutt from the University of Richmond. Uh, two weeks ago, I successfully defended my dissertation. Yay! Uh, yeah, so, so uh, I think we might be the panel here, the one pan the panel that we all proposed when we were not. And now we are. Is that true? What is the proposal? I, I, I defended last August. Oh, you defended? July. Just joking, July. Yeah, July 5th. The fourth of July was awesome. Yay! What do I hit? Oh, never mind. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Excuse me, Dr. Um, I'm talking about, uh, plat we were talking about platforms and platform ethics. So the platform that I'm going to take a look at is G Suite uh, and G Suite for Education. And I'm differentiating between those. Before I jump in, I do want to say what this is not. Number one, it is not an indictment of instructors who use Google Drive or G Suite uh, for education in their classrooms. I am one of them. Um, it is not that. It is not a cautionary tale of loss of data or privacy. Um, I don't think that's happened, although I did, never mind, 2014 I got hacked on Twitter and I didn't realize it till last night. I finally saw, no, I, I realized that I didn't see what had happened until last night when I went to my DMs and, oh, I sent all of those? No, I don't think I did. In 2014, my friend from Iceland told me about it. He said, look, somebody hacked your Twitter. I said, okay, I changed my password. But I didn't, I didn't see what had happened until yesterday. Um, but that's not what this is. It's not about privacy, a loss of privacy, loss of data. And it is not an endorsement of Google or its privacy policies. Um, just a quick, this is what this is. G Suite for Education is, um, 
the educational suite for Google. Most of us, many of us use it. Most of our students have used it. Uh, my daughters, since they were six, have been using it in their K-12 classrooms, and certainly we are integrating it into the regular classroom. G Suite, take off the for education, is the business side of it. It's the part that was first built before education came through. Um, and this is going to look at the differences, some subtle differences in privacy policies between G Suite and G Suite for Education, with an interest in uh, ultimately how do we help our students understand the relationship that they have with G Suite and Google uh, in the classroom. Not an indictment, but a question about ethics. And the question, if you would hit the uh, slide, this is the question that I'm asking. As instructors, are we complicit in eroding the privacy and identity of our students have a right to protect when we ask for or require them to use products like G Suite for Education. Um, and I have started asking myself this question quite a bit. Um, I am an early adopter. I love G Suite for Education. My uh, colleague and I, who I'll get to in a minute, have used this in the classroom for collaborative composing. It is fantastic and it works. It does this well. But I'm beginning to ask myself this question as I continue to delve into <clears throat> privacy policies. This emerged, uh, this project emerged from something that I did in 2015 after reading uh, some theory, of course, uh, but it, uh, a method for mapping. So that this is going to use self and self's uh, method for mapping. Um, that's kind of the direction that I'm coming from. So uh, just a little guideline of what G Suite brings to education. G Suite for Education uh, talks about its services in two sections. It talks about its core services, and these are listed up there. Um, you have to work to find those, but this is the core services. Gmail, Calendar, Classroom, Docs, Contacts, Drive, all of those things, the usual. And these are governed by two policies. There's a third policy that we talked about in a session yesterday. The privacy notice, first policy, the second is the education agreement. The data processing amendment is something related largely to GDPR, G, 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 GPDR. Uh, okay, suddenly I blanked on what those were. Um, but there's also a contract that uh, Google has with your institution that may or may not be public and may or may not be available for you to view. At the University of Richmond, it is not available for viewing. Um, the additional services. So everything else. So think about the Google universe. The use in Google at uh, G Suite for Education of all of these other services is covered by the Google Terms of Service, its privacy policy, and the service-specific terms. And each of these services, almost every one of these services has its own set of policies and procedures and terms of use. So um, they differ in terms of the protection. Uh, examining these difference help, differences helps us better understand Google's corporate ideology. And part of this is about it, it extracting, getting in our, being an art, uh, art field of just trying to do work to uncover um, the ideology behind what Google is doing. Uh, and helps us understand its product services and its relationship to its users. Um, thank you. Uh, so again, this is not an indictment of people who use Google Docs, because I love the Google Docs. But uh, in 2018, well, we wrote it a lot earlier than that, but uh, Maury Brown and I had a piece come out where we talked about specifically about the use of Google Docs and its affordances for collaborative composing based on um, work that we had done, a study that we did in our classrooms. Um, but this is what we wrote. So this session, several years later, is the first time that I'm revisiting what I put in bold. Are we complicit in allowing students to be mined for profit building and targeted advertising? We know that scholars are warning us of the dangers. Um, this is one of the dangers I pulled myself because it was cool to do, uh, but it really is something that we were thinking about several years ago when we put this together. Um, are we compromising the privacy and how valuable is that? We know that it's super valuable to Google. Is it valuable to our students? Yes, it should be. SD Beck. 
talking about surveillance identities. Our writing technologies are redefining through digital surveillance and tracking. And I use some of the, uh, that methods in my work, in my dissertation work, um, to excavate how identity is built, how our digital identity is built and created through surveillance. Um, people are concerned. We're doing this work. The question is, what are we doing about it? So one of the interesting, I believe that if you were at the opening town hall, I believe that the 2019 version of CMW, the keywords for 2019, will have privacy, algorithms, and Google in them. It, it seems clear to me it, uh, in all of the sessions, I really, this is something that's really come up. Um, these were the early, Beck was the early, you know, one of the early voices to say, hold on a minute, there are things happening and we need to be careful about them. Next slide, please. Uh, a little bit uh, much, uh, it's cut off a little bit, but uh, if you go to that URL, and I'm sorry, it is not a pleasant URL, but if you go to that URL, you will find this table. And this is uh, Google's work at different, demonstrating within uh, the G Suite for Education Privacy Notice. Uh, what it considers core services and what it conditions, considers additional services and what the terms are, how they use data, how they use ads, what the security is, and how they can share. So a few things that I want to notice. Uh, we got to know what these core services are. We have to know what these additional services are. Um, you'll see it's not particularly clear here, like Gmail, Docs, Sheets, and Slides. Okay, is drawing like those? Is Google drawing like those? I think it is, but I don't know. You've got to find it elsewhere. Um, and then the additional services, uh, all the other things. Um, clarity, lack of clarity. So when we ask students to post to YouTube, the posting to YouTube, so different things have happened, now we may show ads. Now, in K-12, you'll see that their data is not being used to determine whether they get the ads. That does not count for higher ed. Any of the other services that Google provides, same principle. Data is not used for advertising purposes, but it doesn't, we're not sure what that means. Because just because we don't use it for ads doesn't mean that the data is not being collected and aggregated in order to develop profiles to which marketing can go. That doesn't seem to be prohibited. We're not showing ad, not used for advertising, but is it used for aggregating? Claire, it's just not clear at this point whether that is true or not. We don't share customer data in core services with third parties. Good, that's useful. What are those third parties? You know, we have to ask these questions. Uh, we don't share personal information with third parties. These are not third parties. YouTube, Blogger, Waze, Chrome, Translate, Home, Android, Photos, Google Analytics, and more. All of those are Google products. Those are not third party services. And say all that, you gotta kinda get into it. So this helps us to see a little bit of the difference between these policies. Next slide. So I wanted to use tag map. So I know the privacy policies are difficult to get into. They're long, they're boring, they're challenging. We should look at them, we should read them. This is also not an advocation, I'm not advocating not reading the policies. But an opportunity to map gives us the ability to scrape some content put it out there and just start to see some of the relationships, some of the information, some of the ways Google itself is thinking about what it means by privacy and the privacy policies. So um, I'm using again Self and Self. Uh, this is their contribution to Johnson Elola and Selber's uh, collection Solving Problems in Technical Communication. Um, and this is What are the Boundaries, Artifacts, and Identities of Technical Communication? That's the chapter that this is coming from. I'm using this as the framework for delving into it. They use it as a framework for delving into a much broad, much larger corpus. I'm using it for a much smaller corpus. They also, I'm not going through the entire set of steps that they offer uh, because it is an excellent heuristic and very valuable. 
Uh, I didn't do all of the steps, but I did several of the steps. And this is just to show what I wanted to do at the end, to show I did this thing, it's something you can do with students, and it starts to ask questions and help your students, I believe, ask questions, and perhaps our colleagues as well, ask questions about the way privacy and our relationship with Google as we continue to use Google Docs. Um, we get tag clouds, so I'm using tag clouds. We get them. Big letters mean more important, uh, repeated more often, smaller letters uh, mean repeated less importantly, uh, less often, uh, perhaps less important. Um, again, this is not a proxy for, re for reading the actual policy, but it's an opportunity to take a look and just get a visual. So the process for uh, self and self, if you would get the slide, um, they, uh, it's a rhetorical approach. Let's identify what is the question I want to explore. It's a solve, problem solving as well, it's rhetorical problem solving. What subject do I want to reflect on? What is the purpose of creating the tech cloud? Who's the audience who will look at this and what documents will provide the content? So just so that you know the, con the documents I'm using, I'm using um, the G Suite and G Suite for Education privacy policy. So this is not terms of service, this is strictly privacy policy. Uh, full disclosure, I grabbed it on HTML, copied, pasted the text into a Google Doc. Uh, I did one thing to, and I'll show this in a minute, but I did one thing to the content of that, and that is that I connected G Suite and G Suite for Education as a single phrase. Uh, we can do much more of that in terms of showing relationships. Uh, again, this is intended to be something that you can do uh, pretty quickly with students. Next slide, I'm using Tag Crowd just as a reminder. This is uh, Daniel Steinbach. This is what um, Self and self, uh, it, can be, it can be used, uh, and there's uh, one of the. There are other ways to use these, of course, and more attractive versions of this. One of the things that is useful about this is it does demonstrate. It does have a clear and obvious privacy policy in terms of service. It doesn't collect or store your content, uh, which is uh, useful in, the, in this. It's not a platform that is trying to make money. Next slide, please. So here. G Suite privacy policy or the Google privacy policy. So this is um, just a few ways that I built this maximum number of words to show. I chose 25 because the smaller number is what G Suite for Education has. The privacy policy for Google, which applies to all of Google, including G Suite, is a much longer document. The shorter document is the G Suite for Education privacy notice. I use that as my limiting factor. So 25, I ran several iterations of this to kind of get a sense of, and again, these are recommended by uh, Dick, Dick and Cindy, how you go through the process of uh, building a better understanding of the boundaries of your corpus. The minimum frequency had to show up five times. I wanted to show the frequency. I am grouping similar words, so ing endings. These are things built into it. It would be worth, and uh, is, um, Steinbach is very clear on what his stop words are, um, and is also clear about how words are grouped together, so the similarity, so you can see uh, how this program, this algorithm, is generating a tag cloud. I'm not showing the word Google, and I am combining the string G Suite, so that G Suite appears, since that's the name of the product. There are a few things to notice. There's one thing that Google does, and it does well. It is an information. Put any verb after that. Gathers information. Does it protect information? Well, you can see the relationship between privacy and, and again, this is just in terms of word frequencies. I, I, this isn't intended to make a lot of, draw a lot of relationships between those terms other than to say, they use the word information an awful lot in their privacy policy, and they use the word privacy an awful lot less, 33 to 111. They're really big on services. They like their services. You get to your services with an account. They do a lot with ads, including an interesting term to bring in. What does that mean? We might say that it's inclusive, exclusive, but we also, I'm thinking about, well, um, 
we include the other things too and capture it. All right, that's G Suite. So that's Google's privacy policy put into a word pack. Next one. This is G Suite for Education. So the first thing you may notice is that G Suite for Education is really big. They are very self-referential. The word G Suite did not appear in the privacy policy because it's the Google privacy policy. This is specific to G Suite for Education. So they talk a lot about their self-referential. But you will see that information continues to be uh, the single most important thing that they're thinking about and writing about or using the term services. But the word users pops in. It's not in the other one at all, and it pops in with considerable frequency. It's an interesting shift, um, and part of that is because the privacy notice has a great deal to do about the relationship of the institution adopting G Suite for Education and its relationship to its users, uh, which is, I, I think, it, I, I find it interesting that the, as a second communicator, the word users is not appearing in the Google Privacy Policy. To me, that should be the core of that privacy policy. Um, oh, by the way, the users, those are our students. So there is, clearly, they are thinking about users. Um, they are in the policy that is useful to them. Next slide. The G Suite for Education Privacy Policy includes the following. We hope you will take the time to read this notice. Very nice, very thoughtful, and polite. And the Google Privacy Policy, which both apply to G Suite for Education. So I looked at that table, and it said, these things apply to G Suite for Education, and these things apply to G Suite, but this is also on that table, saying we hope that you will read them, but both apply. So I thought, well, okay, let's put both of them, let's just mash both of them together and see what we get when we have that corpus of two privacy policies put together. Uh, and so the only difference is I decided to show 50 words rather than 25 because it was a larger corpus. Next slide. Um, not a considerable shift. Those users, not as often we use now, we're at 35 here, privacy at 48, Information, 159. Collect pops up. We collect. Uh, we provide. We share. I don't get the proceeds. I haven't seen much in the way of sharing of profit. So the sharing thing, what, where exactly are they talking about sharing? Um, we begin to see what might be seen as a set of corporate values emerging from these clouds. Google is a company most interested in information, and its privacy policies appear to focus on that concept with precision. Google is a company that provides services for doing things with information, perhaps collecting, using, providing, and including it. We might see that Google uses accounts, devices, and services to collect and provide information. Some of that information is personal, and some of that information is shared. So how does mapping help us? Well, we can identify often repeated words. That's good uh, as a proxy for expression of values and activity. Words regularly used in a legal document mean something. So looking at them, maybe that tells us a little bit more about them. We know what Google says about who they are. But what do their privacy policies say about who they are? And do we distinguish that from what they say about who they are? Google says, and uh, in the description for the, this panel, which is not in the program, um, Google in 2016 removed the do no evil slogan from their mission statement. Um, that wasn't quite their value statement. Um, they did remove it. And they have a blog post, and you can read about why they removed that. Um, but it, it suggests some things are happening and changing. If you were to take a look, and I was looking yesterday, in 2017, Google changed its, term, its privacy policy four times. And you can look at the differences, and it will show you the differences between the versions, so you can do a little version control. It's worth looking at. 
We can place repeated terms in relationship to one another in terms of just size and number of repetitions. Where do they repeat more often? It doesn't tell us everything, but it begins to tell us something. Um, and we can isolate key terms from the legal jargon. jargon. Privacy policies are often uh, surrounded by. Um, by pulling the terms out, we get a good sense of what do I need to look at when I go back and I read this and read it carefully. Uh, and so mapping itself is not the goal. Mapping is the starting point to analysis. And that's kind of the end that I want to throw out, that mapping itself is a useful way to think about those boundaries, to think about the way Google considers or thinks about itself and its privacy policies. But the goal in the end is to do the analysis, to spend time focusing on those terms and doing the work in the privacy policies with our students and ourselves, to educate ourselves and understand the relationship that we are placing students in when we ask them to connect to Google. Uh, I do have a few references, uh, mostly the ones that I've mentioned. Uh, do read the G Suite for Education Privacy Notice and the Google Privacy Policy. Um, they are accessible. They are, they are accessible in the sense that they are written and available for you to read. <laughs> there are also videos. That's one thing. I told you I had heard. <laughs>
So up here you have AAC and U's explanation for why they consider e-portfolios a high-impact practice. They added it as the 11th high-impact practice in 2016. In fact, some people call it the meta hip or you know uh, other things like the super hip, which is really dorky, and I don't call it that. Uh, but in their explanation as to why they've added it, I thought it was really important that before they even get a full sentence out, they say pedagogy is platform agnostic. Picking one doesn't mean you suddenly have portfolios. You just have a tool. It's about the pedagogy, it's about the user, and what it is you need from those things. Um, and since this is computers and writing, I don't think I need to super belabor what an e-portfolio is, but it is fair to throw out there that it's more than one thing. Um, when we talk about portfolios uh, among practitioners, we talk about multiple types, we talk about genres, um, and we talk about use, all rhetorical questions, right? And when I'm doing faculty development, I often kind of break it down into really simplified categories like an archive or a repository portfolio where you might use something like Google Drive or Box or whatnot, encouraging users to save over time, you know, indiscriminately. Save everything. You never know what you're gonna need. Um, and then we also talk about the showcase portfolio, which is essentially what everyone thinks about when they think about e-portfolios, these public-facing websites in which students curate artifacts, reflect on their learning process, and so forth. And you can use any number of things for that. Wix, WordPress, Portfolio, Digication, there's anybody willing to sell you a tool any day of the week. Um, and I know that I just mentioned a few tools that some folks at this conference would be horrified to know that I support faculty in using, like Wix or Drive. <laughs> uh, but there's reasons for that. In fact, I think some of the ethical concerns drive us to so, towards those problematic tools, right? Um, and I have yet, and I play with a lot of digital tools to find the perfect one. So if you know of a perfect tool, please give it to me before I leave this conference. <laughs> that would be the world's most amazing takeaway. <laughs> I haven't seen it. And, you know, I also wanted to pause and say, why advocate for something like e-portfolios? What makes them high impact? And I have a list up here that you traditionally hear people uh, give for reasons, and they're all good reasons. They come out of English pedagogy. They should be good. We're talking about ongoing reflection, displaying skills and achievement, encouraging effort over time. If you do a portfolio right, it should not be done the night before. It should be done for years. And, Anyone who's updated their CV knows that's a process, and you constantly change, and you should always be curating that, and your identity changes. We also encourage students to showcase accomplishments, to take credit for work that is often ephemeral and invisible, and making them value the learning process. Um, and then, of course, pr promoting opportunities for feedback from multiple viewers. And then the last one, creating a professional digital identity. And this is where I start to get slightly twitchy. Uh, as both an admin and a faculty member. Um, because as our universities are pushing for these skills-based pedagogies, uh, things like e-portfolios kind of become the flashpoint for that. You know, so for instance, um, I often will, in the course of a day, have well-meaning colleagues send me multiple surveys about what employers want from students. And that's not a bad thing, but I'm like, but that's not the main thing. The e-portfolio isn't just a professional tool, although that's certainly a thing it can do. And um, in a recent article about e-portfolios uh, in ethics, and I will tell you, there are not many, um, <laughs> they said, ethical use of sensitive information in e-portfolios is further complicated by higher education's focus on employability skills designed to be showcased beyond the institution. And I felt this pressure, I felt this push to turn our students into mini worker bees uh, who have to find a way to make the academic endeavor fit these skills that employers are telling us they want, i.e. employers are driving what's happening in our innovation centers. I hate that phrase, but whatever. Uh, so, you know, when we're trying to evolve our pedagogies and making sure they're really doing what they need to do and help students in the most effective way, it bothers me that employers are leading the way in certain things. They shouldn't. Um, so, so I said here, you know, the e-portfolio is not just a robust resume or a better version of your LinkedIn account. And when Chris and 
Dan invited me to join the panel, I, I tried to think of some research questions in relation to ethics. And again, I'm kind of coming uh, uh, in relation to ethics and e-portfolios. And I'm coming from it from a, a very situated position as someone who both uses it in the classroom and teaches others best practices for using it. Um, and so I thought about how are students prepared for ethical use of information and resources in e-portfolios? And on the other side, how are faculty and ad, uh, administrators prepared to consider and address these concerns within their pedagogy? Um, when they asked me to join this panel, I thought, I'm not sure what I'm gonna talk about. And at the end, I felt the need to say, I am in no way going to be exhaustive in what I am talking about. There are a lot of things that are problematic when we talk about something like an e-portfolio. But at least it's let me articulate ideas that have been giving me low-level anxiety for years. Some I overtly tackle, others I don't think can be resolved, but I think they can be addressed and engage with them. Um, and, uh, lost my place, yay. Uh, when they were doing that review of, uh, of ethics and e-portfolio scholarship, the word that would have popped up in a word cloud is dirt. There is a lack <laughs> of people writing about it. So yay for a gap, but boo for what that means for us in terms of people using it, right? And so I'm just going to run through a couple different vectors that I saw both uh, on other universities' uh, talk, uh, websites, because I started reviewing how my colleagues in the field are publicly sharing this information, and then someone like myself who is also doing PD, how are we getting this kind of concern out there? So I saw a few things that were repeated, but other things that I don't think are showing up at all when we're talking about e-portfolios, uh, and we should be. So the first and the most common thing people talk about in terms of ethical use with EPs uh, is the proper use of material. The number one hit is how to incorporate source work in, in e-portfolios, how to cite images, videos, et cetera. There was some talk about copyright concerns, and then that's about it. Um, however, there's a lot more we have to worry about. As students start putting material out there, things like vulnerable populations being exposed in public forums, so for instance, uh, you know, people in teacher training programs who are working with young students. I've seen them put videos of children out that they should not, you know. Uh, but that means we need to train the practitioners in that discipline to think about those concerns. Um, we also, of course, have design and accessibility. And across the, uh, the examples I've looked at, there's a smattering of accessibility discussion, you know, but not a lot. Uh, here's a nice one-page handout on accessibility. You should be good to go. Which is never the case. Um, other things that we need to think about too, uh, and I believe my colleagues in the back there, you talked a little bit about this yesterday in your panel, is a way in which we record and make the learning process visible. I mean, that's one of the things we celebrate about ePortfolios. This is so great. We make we make this visible. Uh, right, we made it visible, and we also made it uh, last. Uh, now it's out there. If you have it on a public-facing website. So folks' early work may linger when they don't want it to. Um, students may form a version of their identity, an early version of their professional identity that they later move away from. I'm thinking, too, of that example of a student um, recently who had acceptance to Harvard, like his Twitter, had yeah. things from years ago. Things like that show up in e-portfolios, too, where students are testing out their theories and opinions about the world, and then you know, your freshman you is determining what happens at your doctoral level, that's terrible. Um, I would never trust freshman Megan with anything. <laughs> you know? um, fortunately, this wasn't around then. So, um, and then also to force students to perform these identities in these forums, uh, such as blogs that often show up on e-portfolios and kind of contrived situations, even though it's supposed to be for an authentic audience. Um, I'm thinking of a personal situation when I was a baby grad student and I was forced to, um, forced, uh, I was made to respond in a blog to various scholarly work and then one of the big baddies uh, did not like the way in which I had reviewed their work and didn't know I was a baby and just came for me like a brick house, like it was awful. Uh, but then I realized, wow, people really do read these, they really do see us, we really are out there. So making that learning process visible is a good thing, but it is um, you know, a double-edged sword, potentially. And other concerns, of course, it, and I think you guys touched on this with your discussion of specific tools, is that student work is also shared across multiple 
platforms in these, they're crafting in multiple places. They may be using Google Docs, Microsoft Word, YouTube, Canva, you name it. That's information that's out there in multiple places, and then they throw it on maybe a website, build or like WordPress, Wix, Weebly, Google Sites, whatever. Um, and all of those may have FERPA considerations, what can and can't go out. Again, uh, we really have to work with faculty to understand what is a student record and what is appropriate to require them to put into public forums. Uh, and of course, as they've mentioned, there's opportunities for data mining depending on where the students are working and what they're sharing. There's also concerns regarding student access and ownership. Uh, a lot of folks, when they purchase things like digication, task stream, portfolio, whatever, students have to keep paying to have access to the material they produced in the university. Uh, and, and I personally, that's highly unethical. Like, uh, 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 we work with students at Old Dominion, many of them who could not do that, right? So that extends an equity gap, right? Uh, so, um, and then you also think who owns those things? If you start looking at the privacy uh, agreements, you know, uh, Blackboard is not neutral, you know? So when people talk about Blackboard, it's like, well, you should maybe look at what they say about what they own that you put on there, right? Um, and then, of course, financial obstacles, which I just pointed to, but this, this idea of purchasing access, retaining access, but not just that. Students also have to be able to have hardware that can run those things. There's research on a lot of populations that are kind of left behind because they're working on older hardware that can't keep up with the kind of tech that we're asking them to use. So, you have the tech consideration, but notice the tech consideration is one of the last things I talked about. Whenever people talk about e-portfolios, a lot of times they start with the tech, and I'm always like, but it's not the tech. You're addressing a problem. What's the why? Why are you doing this? That will drive your tech decision. And then finally, again, because I said I am someone who works very closely with faculty, um, I am a faculty member, but I also work with uh, labor issues regarding what we're asking people to do when we do digital initiatives, and especially using e as kind of a synecdoche key for that. Um, what is the agency those faculty members have within institutional and departmental changes? Can they speak back to these? Can they inform those choices that people are making for them? I think of your comment of, are we agents in eroding privacy? And if you agree that you are, you know, how much agency do you have to do anything about that? Um, also things like expectations for and access to training. Our university has invested in faculty development, fortunately, but I had to convince them that was the way. Um, instead of buying a tool, I said, no, 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 no. You have to get the faculty on board, and they have to see it's valuable in their discipline. But we're not the norm. A lot of people just buy a tool and say, enjoy education, see it, right? Also, we hope the assessment goes well. Um, you know, and so also things like institutional recognition for the time and effort it takes to learn these new tools. When you're using them, if you're doing portfolio pedagogy, right, it will transform the way in which you design your course. In positive ways, I think, uh, but not. Uh, but it takes time and effort, as any of us know who do course design. Um, and then I also think about which faculty are expected to do the work of these kinds of initiatives. It also often falls on contingent faculty who are not invited to training. I had to fight that fight. They wanted all, you know, tenure, upper division writing, and I said, you know who's going to get them started on portfolios, right? It's not the guy teaching the specialized class on dolphins. Um, it's kind of be your adjuncts and such. So that's another consideration. And then, of course, I just referenced discipline-specific ethical issues. I was working with a, a, a professor of architecture, and they were talking about the rules related to blueprints and things like that. And I'm like, man, I have no idea about it. Thank you. Any of that, they have to be involved in those discussions with us. Our, our music education department, where a student got slapped on the wrist because he put it on YouTube, a video of him conducting an orchestra, but he didn't have the permission for the song they were playing, right? Um, and then, of course, the quality of implementation. Uh, we train faculty, we have a lot of support for them, but there is, of course, if issues of tech proficiency, uh, ability to design courses, what kind of critical framework are they using? We advance the idea of integrative learning. This is why we do what we do with portfolios. But if you don't have that underneath, we often get portfolios that, that were chunked out the night before, and they tell you, I've learned a lot in this class, and then there's no evidence of it. And you kind of hate yourself <laughs> for having read that, because you think, I'm a better teacher than this. And the answer is, yes, you are. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned one uh, offhandedly and jokingly, but 
but it's actually not a joke. A lot of universities are pressuring folks to use tools like this because they want assessment data. And then you're turning students into program data. And while that's not inherently evil, it is also problematic <laughs> because I would uh, privilege the learning over the data. Um, and so when people are choosing tech tools, uh, in fact, Shelly Rodrigo and I were laughing over some last night. I asked her, are you getting an assessment engine or are you getting a learning tool? And she said they want an assessment engine. I was like, well, I can tell you which one it meant then. Right? Um, those are very, very different things. And so when I originally threw this out there, I said, oh, okay, I'm going to see what other institutions are doing um, in regards to this in their public facing material, since we know that the published scholarship is lacking on, on, um, on ethics and e-portfolio. And knowing that the public facing materials has multiple audiences, a lot of times they're directed at students, but they're also intended for faculty and admin um, from other universities because they're sharing what they're doing. Um, and I wondered if they would mention ethics explicitly, and if so, which topics would they address? How are they addressing them? Who's overseeing this sort of messaging and training? And I'll tell you, this is nascent. I'm only starting this review. But an immediate standout, if you're looking for one, is Auburn University, who uses Wix, by the way. Um, and they have a whole page dedicated to ethical literacy uh, within the ePortfolio, addressing the student directly uh, and stating, as you create your ePortfolio, you will be making choices and taking actions that could impact yourself and others, which I really liked. That was cool. Mm -hmm. um, they largely address the ethical integration of material and consideration for vulnerable populations. They also discuss, uh, discuss strategies for addressing accessibility issues. They have handouts for both. For other institutions, there are often, but not always, tips on source integration. Every now and then someone mentions accessibility. In terms of addressing the other concerns I just mentioned, I haven't seen it. It's not shared. So for faculty and administrators, I will use the term I said before and say that at least in preliminary searches, there's a dearth of material addressing these concerns. That doesn't mean they're not happening, these conversations aren't happening in workshops and meetings, but at least they're largely not being made explicit in public forums uh, intended to share information about e-portfolios. And I should go ahead and say, uh, when I leave here, one of my first tasks for myself is to make that explicit on the website that I oversee for the PU about ePortfolios. Um, but we do have it implicitly in workshops uh, and such. And I wanted to kind of take this to one more level in terms of ethical uh, concerns with this kind of work um, and make it a little meta. Um, and, I, and, and if you were in our workshop the other day, I threw the same uh, Machiavelli quote out. I should actually wrap myself out and say by, by my primary field of research is early modern literature. I'm a 16th century person, so that should really weird you out that I'm up here right now. Uh, but actually, uh, I was looking at pedagogy and media in that. Um, and I wanted to throw out this quote uh, from Machiavelli because I find the way in which sometimes folks use these concerns as kind of a weapon against encouraging people to try. You know, they'll kind of try to stymie these efforts where their colleagues are exploring new tech and new pedagogies and things like that. And I would argue that I, it's not just because of the ethics. The ethics are problematic. There, there are things we should consider, uh, consider but, um, but I think that there's also anxiety about preserving the old ways, the familiar. You know, our uh, lunch speaker yesterday mentioned familiarity can stymie innovation. And again, I'm not one of those Mary Sunshine tech people who's like, all tech solves all problems. But I, I think there is some good in exploring it, right? Um, in fact, at AACNU, uh, one of our colleagues referred uh, proudly to himself as the wet blanket on e-portfolio enthusiasts, as though we're all just sitting there like throwing confetti every time a website is made. Um, you know, uh, these are legitimate concerns. But the fact that I can so readily list a series of issues and still find it a useful endeavor for the, for the academy, I think is, is actually really important. So, um, you know, I said here that it's a sketchy digital landscape out there and our students should be aware of the limitations and the exchanges they agree, uh, agree to by participating. And then let's hope I've animated this page right. Okay, so I leave some panels <laughs> thinking, uh, what can we do besides have an adult beverage and talk with 
our colleagues until too late the night before a presentation. So I'll share what I think a few of us have identified as a takeaway solution to these systemic issues. And the answer is it's small moves. I'm only being somewhat flippant in this meme. I think we can make cultural changes through faculty development because that is where these concepts make their ways to students with any luck. And I think training colleagues across the disciplines to think about the concerns we're discussing is key to helping people see ethical use as a genuine concern relevant to the comp composition that happens in their field. Uh, and with e-portfolios in particular, we're preparing the next round of field practitioners, asking them to begin constructing identities within their disciplines. So it's in our best interest if they are armed with the ability to identify such issues and form strategies in response so that those future practitioners are also ethical. So even those brief 
be more vocal about it, but we also have to go beyond our own little academic world, right? We have to be mindful of what we're teaching our students in terms of critical literacy skills, and then we have to go to the general public at large because people have this vague idea, oh yeah, they're taking my data, you know, how, how really important is that? But then when you start talking about cookies, persistent cookies, um, how they share their data with third parties and who the hell are these third parties, and then they start combining that data to build a whole profile of who we are as consumers and selling that data to other third parties, then they're like, well, holy cow, who even knew? Right? So until that filters out to the well, general public. Yeah. Well, I think the, the uprising she's talking about would have to be organized on Google Drive, live <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> streamed on Twitch, and yeah. our archive Social media, put it out on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I know we're over time. Um, so if you have questions, feel free, we'll hang up here. But, uh, is there another time after this? Or is it one seat to another seat to another seat? Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.